Well, welcome to uh, one of my monthly events. We refer to it as the, the Pyramid Insight Hour. Um, those of us at um, Tal Intelligent know that I, I have this ongoing need to uh, explore questions and then decide that maybe I should share the kinds of things I'm finding. And I am delighted that you folks chose uh, either to attend today or listen in if you listen into the, um, the recording. Today's topic, finding, landing, and keeping talent, is one that I know is front and center on a lot of the minds of those folks responsible for managing the talent in organizations. And some of the things I'm going to say today will reaffirm the practices and things you're already doing. Uh, there will be some things that I may well say today that will prompt some new thoughts and approaches that hopefully you'll find uh, useful. Now, I also have a concurrent um, series of topics that I call the economics series. And every other month I focus on a particular EQ related issue. You see in June, um, the whole issue of demonstrating empathy uh, and we're going to explore empathy, its, its benefits and costs, if you will. Uh, in August, we'll look at stress hardiness. In October, we'll look at the whole business of how we utilize emotional energies for constructive uh, outcomes. So I alternate the months with a very focused talent management issues with my economics uh, areas of interest. As you know today, um, I um, suggested that we are in the middle of a rather formidable war for talent uh, throughout, uh, particularly the Western economies um, that um, uh, require us to pay attention to how we look for talent, how we in fact bring talent into uh, our community, if you will, and what we do to keep them here which are all very important topics. And important enough that a lot of people are writing various uh, significant pieces, uh, actually, on the different issues related to talent and potential. <clears throat> and uh, one very popular one at the moment, the one-page talent management piece by Mark Efron is not a one-page talent management piece. <laughs> his, <laughs> his book title, uh, <laughs> Uh, gets a lot of attention, but if you look at the book, he's he covers a whole variety of things uh, that were parallel issues that um, we certainly will talk about today. Um, you can't go wrong with Ron Sharon's material and the leadership pipeline is, is certainly a powerful way to think about uh, how we look at uh, motivating and inspiring and bringing talent into organizations. And of course, my business partner, Bob Eichinger, and dear friend, Michael Bardo's piece, The Leadership Machine, uh, is what I think of as a required reading if you're really interested in the whole notion of what we do to foster and build talent. Now, it seems to me, as I, and, and perhaps you're seeing similar sorts of um, articles and pieces that are showing up in the literature that we have some formidable talent problems here in the West, especially. The shifts in population are formidable. I, I saw a long piece uh, issued uh, this past week on how um, COVID has actually um, dropped our childbirth rate rather significantly um, and it has been a part of an ongoing trend and this accelerated that trend which is going to have implications over the next uh, 20 years for sure and of course we know the social and technological shifts that are occurring um, have an impact not only in terms of what people want from the work that they do but also the expectations of the kind of skill they bring to the work um, the way in which people acquire or are reskilling themselves for the rapid changes in uh, 
the work that does in fact uh, is available. And then of course, there's the ongoing need to rethink and redesign the way in which work is, uh, uh, what the expectations are and how a person is to fulfill the requirements. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I don't know if the slides should be advancing. They are not advancing for us. It should be advancing. It is not? Not for me, and I think not for Kathy. Okay, well, let's try this again. I'm going to... There we, it did now. I don't know if do you want to go and show. Is it there now? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Because the first time I had it up, it was, it, now you see what I was talking about in terms of the different books. Yes. Thank you, yes. LM. I would have been merrily That's going Kathy. along. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going along thinking you were seeing exactly what I had in mind. And so when I said the problem, then I was talking about the various issues of the problem. And we just proved my technological limits um, yeah. is one of those things that uh, lots of people are bumping up against as technology is is really thrusting uh, work shifts on us in traumatic ways. I, I was also reading a piece on the new technology on computers and how we're moving to quantum computing at a rather rapid rate, which is going to have all kinds of implications for artificial intelligence and rope robotics and what that's going to mean for work uh, we're only just beginning to truly understand and then of course um, one of the problems that I believe we, we see uh, is the the lack of a fully uh, planned and thought through system design as it relates to talent and those all feed the problem when I, when I look around to see what people are doing and saying and, and thinking about my own experience and working with organizations, I like to go take a sampling. And I, um, I typed in talent management systems, talent management methods, talent, you know, all the standard terms and bumped around a hundred sites or so. And almost all of them um, say, well, here are the things we need to do. If you're serious about talent management and you're serious about making sure that you are gonna get the people you need for your organization to sustain itself, here, here are the things you have to do. Here's your punch list. And as I look at the punch list and I reflect on my own experience with a whole array of organizations and one particular comes to mind that I'm gonna talk about today because it's such a classic example of a moderate sized organization. What's missing from this list in my mind is the thoughtfulness and intentionality about what we'll refer to as a magnetic employment culture, which is attractive, it pulls people to it and it, it has distinctive attributes there are uh, elements that are compelling in, uh, to a potential employee and the ongoing employee. And there is a substantiated magnetic culture where um, there is a lot of walking the talk and there's authenticity about what it means to work in a particular entity. And the example I would give you I know people, when they hear these sorts of things, they think, well, that works for the large organization. Does this work really for the small entity? And I would tell you that the answer is yes. And a long-term project I had with a engineering uh, services company, which provided and continues, it thrives actually, and you'll see why here in a minute, um, to provide all kinds of technological, services with clients related to everything from big pumps to big machinery, um, helping address all kinds of issues that they that we know you have to have technological capabilities uh, to deal with. It takes a very specific kind of employee um, to work in this particular place. And what this CHRO and I talked about was 
how intentional she was in thinking about these particular things. How do we create a culture that is so distinctive that people want to check it out, that is so compelling that people would find it exciting to work here, and so authentic that um, even though the work we might think of as in many cases very uh, physically demanding and dirty work, still nonetheless, um, people are excited to work there and want to work there. And as uh, she was talking about this, I, I uh, couldn't help but remember, and I'm sure many of you have heard this story about the kid who walks up to the bricklayer and ask the bricklayer, you know, what are you doing? And the bricklayer looks at the kid and says, well, actually I'm building the house of God. Thank you very much. And um, uh, that's what the bricklayer believed that he was doing. He wasn't laying bricks. He was building a synagogue. So um, our perspective, our orientation, our intentionality, shows up in the way in which we think about the kind of employment culture we want to have. And in this particular example of this moderate sized company, they had uh, 490 employees. Um, one of the things that, that they did to help communicate the messaging about uh, their particular environment, they really focused on um, how they we're attending to safety throughout all of the work that they do, how people were gonna have opportunities to work on different kinds of projects. In other words, you might've been hired because you were um, had a certain engineering expertise, but you were gonna have the opportunity to work on an array of projects that would keep you stimulated and interested. And of course, um, they had, um, uh, constant languaging around being growth minded in the organization and how uh, the business wanted to grow with the people who were there. Um, there was a consistent messaging around the importance of people and you'll see that in just a sec, as well as the whole notion of um, being a fair minded workplace. And that was communicated in all kinds of things around their policies and the ways in which people were carefully and intentionally onboarded uh, into the organization. And what this CHRO said is that we, we have and have embedded throughout our organization from the president all the way down to uh, the individual who's responsible for keeping the building that we work in in good shape. We operate on the principle that it is really the people that work here, their ideas, their experience, the way they do things, and their attitude is absolutely vital to us having the kind of magnetic culture we believe is vital for our future. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is that when I started working with this organization, and I've I've worked with lots of different companies where they have messages like this, but when it gets down to brass tacks, you start finding cracks in the system. But in this particular organization, what so impressed me was that in point of fact, uh, they, they were so magnetic. They had plenty of people who wanted to work there. Um, the students, when they would put out notices in engineering schools, um, they would uh, do things uh, pre-COVID to go visit and recruit and then during COVID uh, to set up uh, announcements for few positions that would become available when they did. Um, one of the things that, as I listened to their story and I said to her, you know, this attitude about service to the customer we hear everywhere and occasionally the notion of being in service to each other, but how does this live itself out? And she proceeded to describe the specific behaviors that are embedded in their performance management system to monitor the ways in which people provide and have a service orientation 
and what they refer to as service leadership. And she told me that people who do not em embrace this orientation and do not embrace partnership um, will mean that they won't work here any longer. It's not because of their technical skill that they get let go. It's not because of their uh, work uh, habits that they let go, that they're let go. It's because they fail to embrace. And she said, you know, we we make this, we believe this, we walk this. It's embedded throughout the organization. And I asked her during during the past year, how have you maintained this culture with so many people uh, doing work from home, having to navigate inside the plant in different ways? How projects have had to be managed in different ways. And she said, you know, we do what we do, but 10 times more of it to make sure that the talent knows that we want to live the idea that we are only as good, we are only as vital and sustainable um, as we nurture the people who work here. And in fact, she said, we've lost no one during this time, which is not something I could say of a lot of other organizations that I've had a chance to work with. And in fact, when I drop into some organizations, this is typically sort of the imaging that goes with it. People are in their proper roles and in their proper suits, if you will. Um, and everyone's working as hard as they can to do what they think they should do. But there isn't the same direction, alignment, or commitment um, as an organization to achieve a particular cultural lens um, that says we are a place where we want to be a magnetic informant culture where people bring their best, where they feel excited in the work that they do, and they feel they're going to get the support they need to be successful. I've been listening to, and perhaps you have as well, to all of the various fun sources of information about what's happened during COVID and the, the, in terms of employment issues and the numbers of people who, who during the COVID crisis decided to go ahead and take early retirement or to rather abruptly leave organizations where they had been for a period of time had the impact of limited knowledge transfer with the people who they left behind. The numbers of small businesses who now indicated they will not be able to restart, not because of a lack of funds, but because of a lack of talent. Um, the per, the uh, Fortune 500 companies who've indicated that uh, the gaps in their management uh, ranks are continuing to grow and COVID only accelerated those gaps. The percentage of students who have completely dropped out of college and have not indicated uh, when they plan to return, as well as the number of students who've put college on hold has been formidable. Uh, so we also know that there have been a staggering number of people who have changed positions by, and all they did was change Zoom addresses um, while they uh, went to other jobs where they believed they were going to get a better deal. So we know COVID has had a significant impact and complexifies the challenges we have <clears throat> to find uh, on board and nurture the talent that we need for sustainable organizations. When I went looking for data to explore the whole topic, it struck me that um, almost every uh, piece of research I could find that had substantive evidence was uh, mostly pre-COVID data. And of the initial studies that I've been reading, it appears that the trends have been, if you will, accelerated in a whole variety of ways. Uh, the labor force groupings have changed during COVID. Uh, the numbers of people who are in the 55 and older group in the workforce um, have been significantly cut um, because uh, 
the choices that they've had to, to go and do something different or step out of the organizational setting that they had uh, seem to be a better solution than trying to work in the entity uh, where they were, uh, which of course then leaves um, a whole host of gaps within those organizations. Also, when asked the question of where is our projected employment going to go, and again, each of these have um, been accelerated in terms of percentages. The, the healthcare related occupations uh, are going to even be greater over the next 10 years. The rare various service occupations are going to dramatically increase. And of course, the STEM related work, uh, we know uh, by virtue of the technology issues are, are in fact going to increase. In a study by um, the Leadership Council, uh, I think the evidence was pretty compelling that when organizations are asked, what are our challenges in hiring talented people to help our organizations thrive, um, this sense of competition and the actuality of competition for talented people is, is exponentially greater um, than it was. The number of candidates who um, may not have the work experience for the roles that are available uh, seems to have increased, as well as um, the number of, of applicants who, whose interests have dropped um, in, in terms of pursuing particular sorts of roles. So when we are asking the question, what are the reasons that, that you're having difficulty finding folk, uh, we see these to be accelerated answers. So I'm curious, what have you seen in the work that you've done or the organizations you've either been in or worked with that were some of the most successful recruiting tactics um, that you observed? So in your chat space, if you would, um, take a look at uh, and just drop in what particular strategies or tactics uh, did you find to be most effective. Interesting non-traditional resources such as vets and moms returning to the workplace. Interesting. Engaging students via internships, in senior engineering projects, right? We've done that too in our operation where we've uh, created some internships for uh, MBA students, particularly who, or I O psych students who were interested in understanding the business more. And, uh, we had competition for those internships, very popular way. Mm. Yeah, communicating the, the the value proposition. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about the career path opportunities here in just a minute, because I do think that's important in the messaging to potential uh, folks inside of uh, the recruiting initiatives that you do. Certainly, we know that these are the more standard uh, tactics that are used and increasingly because of the highly social media linked uh, younger generation, those internal and external contacts of people who tell the narrative and tell the story of what it's like to work uh, in their particular organization is uh, I think a big deal. And we, we're gonna need to leverage that more and more um, because they do seem to talk they do seem to share the news uh, and with great excitement when things are going well and great 
energy when things aren't going so well. Uh, and so that's uh, one of our exploding areas of potential uh, talent discoveries through using those internal and external uh, contacts. I was aware as I look at LinkedIn, more and more companies utilizing LinkedIn as a way to advertise roles and positions. Uh, but I suspect um, the greater opportunity is going to be the uh, references by those who are work there. Now, one of the things that we would say around the messaging with future talent and the identification and landing talent, the talent you want to land, that we all know we want to avoid the false positive and the false negative selection. We don't want to hire the person who simply um, uh, doesn't uh, appears to, but doesn't really have the skill or attitude to be successful in the operation, or we fail to hire the person who could be spectacularly successful. And we would say that the best way to message your, your culture and to ensure that you're going to be finding the talent that will enable you to achieve the kind of employment, compelling employment culture you want, is to use a methodical systematic interviewing process, behavioral interviewing process that enables them to learn the kinds of things that are really valued in the organization and it helps give you the biggest opportunity to reduce potential bias and selection. Um, that issue is increasingly important as we think about diversifying talent um, in our organizations. And I'll go back to my small engineering firm we all know that in STEM related professions, um, finding minorities who are um, in those professions and seeking them and getting them into roles is a real challenge. But in this particular operation, um, they had a formidable diverse population of people of color and women. Um, and she, the CHR, would talk about how she overhauled their hiring methodology and hiring process and how they started using the methodical systematic behavioral interviewing process um, and what a difference it made, not only in the confidence of who was selected, but in how the candidate felt that they were being um, considered and how they were being brought into the organization because they had, if you will, a clearer idea of the kinds of questions and the kinds of interests that the organization has for people who work there. I'm curious, if you will, in the, in the uh, chat box, what are some of the ta tactics that you've seen that really um, helps convince candidates that a particular place is the best place to work. What, what is it that's, that's really brought them on? Now we know salary is a big deal initially, but it's not the whole story. Yeah, Kathy's sharing uh, evidence from the thing I shared a little earlier, people changing jobs by just changing Zoom addresses um, and in almost all cases that I know, Kathy, it's the same, that the job offer, the salary increase and the benefits increase for essentially the same job was so compelling um, that they uh, couldn't avoid it. Yeah, talking to peers, the flexibility that's seen there, um, certainly important. Visit. Yeah, the opportunity to visit, get to meet people, get a sense of the passion and energy. And again, it's fascinating that you say that, this, this company that I have been using as an example today, um, I'll never forget when I walked into the, the foyer um, where everything was very intentionally um, comfortable, the receptionist was very warm and welcoming. Uh, 
as I sat in this space waiting for my first meeting with the CHRO, I watched how employees came into the building and how they walked around and talked with each other. And I said to the CHRO, I said, I, I don't know when, I've been inside of a business where everybody who came to the front door to come to work had a smile on their face, was actually looking forward to seeing the person at the front desk as opposed to looking at their cell phone. And when they saw other employees, the genuine warmth and welcome with each other uh, is really quite a uh, remarkable. I said, I found myself wanting to work here <laughs> just by virtue of the environment that I was observing in the way people were behaving. And she said to me, um, that's a part of our service culture here. We mean it. We work and partner with each other and we are to treat each other no matter what our role, no matter what our position, with the utmost and greatest respect. Now, in the Corporate Leadership Council, of course, collects data and shares data and a whole variety of reports. And of late, uh, in asking the question about when people take on roles, what seems to motivate them to go for a particular position? And you can see amongst the factors that they look at, uh, salary and compensation being one of them. Uh, quite interesting management, manager, quality being the most uh, profound, uh, whether or not the particular business travel was expected and or opportunities for it among the work-life balance question um, was top of the three factors. And then of course, um, the organization itself and the organizational reputation matters. So the very things that we've been talking about that I've been sharing with you are in fact the very things that seem to make the difference in not only getting the kind of talent we want to be drawn to the organization, but when we want to get them um, to work and come on board, the kinds of things that matter, the two that are most uh, interesting, of course, compensation package, but the manager quality issue is one that I think gets ignored. Um, and only gets attention when people are asking the question, why did you leave? And I think we, we should pay attention to the messaging around how managers treat visitors, for example, and treat interns um, that make a difference and help create the narrative that shows up in social media. What are some of the things you've observed that organizations have been doing to retain talent um, we'll talk about some things that we know uh, tends to work pretty effectively, but I'm curious, what are things you've observed that uh, really um, the things organizations are doing that, that keep people excited to work in a particular enterprise? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we could have quite an interesting conversation about feedback rich environments and what, what that really means. And do people really mean it? <laughs> they say they want to work in a place like that. I think um, when we listen to the newer folk showing up to work, about what feedback rich means has different connotations um, than <clears throat> what some folk at work think that means. And that's worthy of some exploration. I do think you're right uh, about the career pathing issue being an important part of it. In fact, um, there's a big consulting project we're in the middle of, and this question of how do we give people sufficient opportunities to gain their in their capabilities inside of a fairly constricted, if you will, technologically driven business 
Um, and that question is really a preeminent question for the particular organization to address. And we have some ideas for them that we'll share with you here in a bit. And yeah, taking on projects that are critical um, are very, very important. Yeah, right. The importance of supportive and nurturing feedback being key for retaining talent. After all, what I said earlier was that the single most important attribute for keeping people employed is manager quality. Now, when we think about manager quality, um, that's, that's kind of an interesting phrase because when you start unpacking that, it really comes around to some of the issues, for example, when we look at organizations and we start looking at what, what do managers do? What are the things that they do that help create the culture that people, where people want to work? And yet, uh, in study after study, the evidence keeps coming back that uh, folks in leadership roles, and we, we are going to use leadership in a very generic sense here, because Deloitte did, that there is a huge deficit of the kind of skill that managers need to help respond to um, the current workplace. So what we know to be true is not only helping managers be better coaches of talent is a big deal, but part of it is managers need to understand that the way in which we keep talent is treating people with a great deal of respect and regard and engaging them in conversations about uh, opportunities to have various experiences that will expand their capability. So there's no more strong, there's really not a stronger message that I am confident in you and that I am supporting you than say, gosh, let's talk about some experiences you'd like to have and let's help you uh, get the experience that will help you build capability for the future. Of course, you see a fragment on the screen of one of our career building guides. We've taken the 21 number, the 21 key lessons of experience that come up from multiple lines of research and coded those against particular kinds of practices to say, if, if, if you need a person to learn more about um, a particular practice, then think about this particular experience to help them grow. Um, and being intentional about that is a very important part of what's thought of as manager quality. Um, the manager showing a keen interest in um, the career opportunities and career experiences of the people um, they're trying to lead. Now, everybody has a a way of trying to create a, a checklist. And we are very much a part of the notion that if you want to true create this compelling culture, then there are things we know, evidence tells us, science tells us um, that these are things that are vital to that being critical um, to achieve the kind of environment that will be compelling where people want to come and work and in fact, uh, where they will work with energy, gives discretionary effort, and continue to work through the arc of their careers and contribute to the organization. And, and I wouldn't, I suspect none of these particular items are um, new to you. However, um, there are some ways of approaching these which evidence tells us is more successful than others. So we think, for example, in the work that we do and the assistance that we give, the small, the medium, and the large organization is that when we can get people um, in the organization committed to creating the job profiles that are essential for success inside of a particular operation, that that's a building block of helping communicate the message of the kind of talent that's needed and where there could be gaps that need to be filled um, by engaging in a systematic, methodical way of, of creating those profiles. 
above and beyond the whole notion of what are the technical or functional skills that are needed. We all know that even when you find the technical and functional skills, that may not be sufficient for a person to be successful in the organization. And so we have a particular way of thinking about roles and practices um, that highlight the, the issues that we think um, give the message that the role is vital to the success of the operations. That also the use of proper surveys that help identify the strengths and the gaps within the current uh, talent pool is very important. And I've already mentioned how important it is to have those methodical interviews. And again, um, there is a way of doing that that carries a greater opportunity for success. Uh, and as I said earlier, being very intentional and use uh, the evidence of assignmentology on how to build targeted capability over the arc of a career. We, we know these things. None, none of this is, in one sense, new to us in this field. We do know, however, um, we, we have some very particular innovations that are very important for people to get their head around. Um, the knowledge, skills, <clears throat> and attributes, what we think of KSAs, of potential, of leaders, of managers, of individual contributors, are all vital for success. And you and your organizations, you know, however small or large, <clears throat> we have this pipeline of talent that's that's at work. And as we studied what's really going on at the individual contributor level, what's really going on at the supervisor manager level and the, the leader level, um, we really found as we did this analysis of uh, each of these levels that there were particular roles uh, at each level uh, with the individual contributors, 10 roles, with manager supervisors, 11, and with leaders nine, and as you know, our nomenclature, knowledge, skills, and attributes, that's my KSA. And within those, uh, to fulfill those roles, there are particular practices. And all of these were intended to help us get a handle on, in very practical ways, the kinds of behaviors that drive success at these levels of the organization. And once you, you have those libraries, you're able now to be more precise, not only in creating the profiles, but also in doing the kind of interviewing that will bring the talent in and help people feel they're a part of a system where they can grow over time. Now, we know organizations who are serious about succession planning need to be thinking about potential and how to tap into potential and nurture high potentials, especially as well as nurture teams and help teams be successful. So um, what we would say is <laughs> the creating of the magnetic culture really begins when we start focusing on the kinds of behaviors uh, at each level of the operation that enable people to be successful there and that are prioritized um, based on the context and the goals and objectives of that particular enterprise. So if we just scan, for example, um, and, and what's interesting when we present this to uh, various operations and they think about their individual contributors, we often hear, wow, um, that's, that's a very interesting way to think about individual contributors and messaging to them um, how important it is to uh, fulfill certain kinds of roles in order to thrive um, in their particular part of the organization. Same thing around managers and supervisors, getting them to embrace in a certain priority for the particular operation, the particular roles that will enable them to be um, successful at that level, as well as in the leadership arena. In the last week, it's been interesting seeing them LinkedIn, the amount of energy people are putting into talking about vision. And while vision is very important, 
uh, from the leadership level of organizations. We happen to know that you can have a great vision, but if you aren't busy forming the culture and you aren't busy uh, attending to the talent futures of the people in the organization, you're not busy uh, attending to the stakeholders, then success um, is going to be uh, not at your fingertips. That in fact, vision is not sufficient um, to lead an organization at this level. And the failure of leadership at this level is extremely expensive as we all know. So, Roger, uh -huh. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sophia's got a good question that I think fits here, and that's how do you overlay or integrate values into this process? You just talked about vision, and I think you mm -hmm. really let the context for values earlier. Um, how do we get that into the how and not just the what? And I was wondering if it was aligning it with, you know, card sorting or prioritization of the behaviors within that context. But what would you say about ensuring that vision is is reflected here i'm sorry values are reflected mm -hmm. here yeah well and let's talk about what the values bundle needs to be every human being carries around a set of values muted um can yeah. you hear me um, yes yes Thank it's you. it's kind of interesting um, yeah the values question is one where you have to ask yourself what are the values that we intentionally want to nurture and in my mind that's a cultural question um every and i every every executive and leader i say this to they shake their head say yeah that's true and then promptly behave as though they have no control over it. There is always a culture and the culture maintains and reinforces certain behaviors. And those behaviors are reflective of a line of values about the operation and people's role in the operation. So it is in my mind, the values question comes to what is it we intentionally want to nurture and foster? So when we get into culture, and let's say we intentionally want to foster diversity, we intentionally want to um, encourage an environment where innovation is celebrated and appreciated, and that it means that there's failure that's welcomed. It's how we do that that uh, manifests how those values live out inside of an operation and an organization. And, and those things are um, fundamentally, in my mind, and others certainly can see this differently, um, a cultural question. And I'll, I'll bring it to the little company I was talking about earlier. In their mind, the whole notion of being partners with one another, being in service to each other's goals, is a part of their culture. And they live it and they talk it and they provide opportunities for feedback about how much customer support we're giving each other. Um, and I, I do think that's uh, uh, a part of the messaging. And in fact, if we think about uh, at, at the, uh, I'll go back to the individual contributors, for example. When we think about communicating to individual contributors about being a good citizen in our operation, what does it mean to be a good citizen here? Well, that means, in the case of the example I was using a minute ago, a minute ago um, that means that when we walk around and communicate with each other, we communicate respect and regard, and um, we uh, make sure that it's reinforced at every turn and opportunity that being a good citizen here involves certain kinds of behavior. So to the values question, I think it's there, but it's there when we get down to particular practices and the way those things get reinforced um, in, in the organization. So here are just some of the, the various practices in the different libraries. And I just chose those 
that in my mind consistently impact the culture and help create what I refer to as a magnetic, uh, compelling culture, which uh, has diversity in it, has uh, a sense of um, authenticity where people want to work and want to feel as though this is a place where they can see their careers unfolding. So these are the practices. If I were, if someone were asking me, how do we be more intentional about creating a magnetic culture? I would say you need to make sure throughout the organization people are attending to these kinds of behaviors. Well, as you know, um, we have all kinds of tools to help you easily employ these strategies from virtual sorting to the development guides to interview guides that help you achieve all of the various things um, that we've talked about. And I, I hope that, as I said when I started, I'm gonna say some things that confirm what you already know, uh, perhaps affirm uh, some things you've been thinking about, hopefully prompt you to do some things uh, maybe a little differently, or at least check out some of the tools that might help you achieve some of the things you're looking to achieve in your talent management role um, and encourage you to participate and join me in some of my uh, next uh, uh, issues that I'm going to explore, especially in the, as I call it, the economics topic. Um, please be sure and check our events calendar. We have all kinds of things. You might ask some friends uh, to attend some of our overviews, to learn more about the kinds of things that we're doing that can help people coach, mentor, uh, facilitate uh, the maximum use of capabilities and skills, because I so strongly believe that we should use the science that we have to help us be successful uh, in nurturing the growth within the organization. So I hope you will, in fact, visit us